morning. Huh. Oh, cool. Sorry, I had to get my caffeine sorted. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that looks good. It's, it's funny because I can't even be online without a cup of coffee in my hand, it seems like now. <laughs> you need it. It's, a, it, it's a, almost like blood at this point or water in my body. <laughs> um, well, what do you think, Jeff? Should we get started? Um, I mean, I guess we can. It's three oh, minutes yeah. premature, but there are a lot of people on already. And I, I know that we have the one hour time limit. So being that I logged on early means we're going to probably run out early, right? That's so. okay. I think we're talking about going for 30 or 40 minutes. So. Yeah, exactly. We have a little window. Yeah, correct. We don't see you guys, Michelle, just your little icons. Whatever your image is on Instagram that you have saved is what I'm seeing. So, yeah, I think let's go ahead and get started, and we can always revert back if people join in and maybe ask a question that we have to repeat. That'll be fine. So I, I actually added the photo in the background just because I was playing with my phone, and it's one of very few native Texas clay pieces that I've actually fired. So I may try to re... I guess I could just when, leave that up there, right? When did you make that, Jeff? When did I make it? Good yeah. question. Probably like 2016 or 17. So it's, that's just, just the Texas clay and wood fire. There's no glaze on that. And I believe that clay actually came from the Tyler area. So at, at one point I went up and did an installation at UT Tyler and I, I brought back a pickup truck load of clay with me. And so one of the things that I've discovered is clay in this area. And I, I was reading the, a US, what the heck is it? US geologic survey or something. And found out that there's a high calcium content in a lot of the clay in this area being the Houston region and I think that would account for its low firing temperature because calcium essentially is whiting right and that's a flux in most glazes at higher temperatures so but it seems it's like clay what's that do you think there's a high calcium content because of the all the shells Potentially, yeah, because it used to be a sea basin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I'll just do a little bit of an introduction because I know we, we do have, we have lots of Clay Houston people here and lots of people who might already know us, but I think mm -hmm. there's, um, I think there's some internet as well, so, um, Jeff, Jeff Forster, I'm Anna Mayer, and um, Clay Houston, an organization um, in Houston of ceramic enthusiasts and um, ceramic educators, uh, ceramic artists. They asked Jeff and I to have a conversation today, um, primarily in in uh, reference to the textile clay challenge which is something that Clay Houston is doing uh, at the moment, asking people in Texas to go out and wild clay, um, uh, just out in the landscape and make something with it. So there's a hashtag, wild, Texas Wild Clay Challenge. Um, and Jeff and I both use uh, wild clay or native clay in our, in our work, in some of our work. In ceramic, so they got us together to talk a little bit about it. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so anyway, I guess I have.
have a couple questions to start with that I'll that I'll ask you, Jeff, if that's okay. okay. Um, I love seeing the demo that you did recently. You you did a takeover for Kaisen's Instagram. This long demo where you um, kayaked out to a little island in is it a lake or a by near where you live? Right. Um, and you harvest your clay there, um, and then you you didn't take it very far. You just brought it back to the bank of the, the river or lake, whatever it was, and um, made something with it on the spot that you then fired and just left on the shore there, um, which because it's not fired, it'll it would just... Um, get washed away basically. And I didn't know, is that like a kind of formal body of work that you've been doing or was that a one-off thing? No. Yeah, so I did a lot of work kind of in that vein, but mm -hmm. it's been a while. So in my graduate studies, I was doing a lot of these outdoor pieces where I would build structures in the location where I found the material. And the idea was that I, I came to native clay because of the working in ideology of impermanence and like cycles and that sort of thing. And thinking about how entities as they decompose and return to the earth or their place of origin, right? And so I was building these structures in remote locations so that the material would basically return to where it came from. And so I like the, that idea of the unfired clay being this like living kind of material that has a has a lifespan and changes throughout its duration, just like the human body might. And yeah. so I've actually I've not done as much of that work since I've been in, in Houston, but I have done some scattered things here and there. So, and of course, of course, doing things in a remote location, then usually the the question is, who's the audience? Like, how do you bring it into a gallery setting and all those challenges? So a lot of that work ended up being like photographs or I've even done videos where I've done not a time lapse, but like, took a photograph like once a week for several months from the same vantage point and then stitch those together so you can actually see the form kind of decomposing over time so yeah well and i think the thing about uh found clay or wild clay or native clay is that it it's not optimized um like it, it might not be as easy to build with as the clay that is kind of manufactured and processed for various applications. Um, or it might not fire in the same way. Um, so it's kind of interesting, I think, about that. Um, because when I, I don't use wild clay on a large scale but I do understand how different it is to work with, and I don't process it to make it um, kind of easier or more plastic. Right. So, yeah. Are, are, are you actually firing the wild clay when you use it? Yeah. I've, I've recently been embedding it into other clay bodies and then firing um, that to cone five, so mm -hmm. the, the wild clay is over fired and and kind of melting. Um, mm -hmm. So, although the the clay that I found in Houston or that I've been using in Houston um, is it it doesn't melt, just kind of gets a cone five. It gets really brittle and really red. Um, right. But that that clay is all I'm using clay from construction sites and so it's kind of the first layer underneath 
the soil um, mm -hmm. in the east end woods near the where I teach. Um, it's pretty consistent that that sound clay. Um, I think it's because of the layer that it's coming. So right. I think I, probably I, pro probably clay. most of the clay I've used here also has come from construction sites as far as native yeah. clay and I, I often question if that's actually a Houston clay because it's so often has that intense orange, like high iron content. And I, I yeah. think that's actually coming from North Texas. And like you said, they probably have a mine that that's, that that's coming out of. And so it's like a consistent layer in the earth that they're excavating, I would guess. And then it's coming in as part of the construction. I think so. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I think there's predominantly like three types of native clays in the Houston area and they're gumbos. So like a yellow, there's kind of a blackish and then a blackish brown color. And yeah. most of those, like you said, melt out at like five, six, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, that's very interesting. I had assumed that it was, um, like, specific to the area, because it's so consistent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I actually found some of that clay along Buffalo Bayou when I was walking along there um, as well, but that could, be, that could have come in through I mean, it's interesting. Wild clay sounds in an urban setting um, because it's so um, not wild. <laughs> yeah, it's so mediated. I mean, I, I thought about it. Um, I was teaching a clay processes class, and we went to a construction site on the University of Houston campus um, where they had pulled down all these old dormitories. Um, these beautiful dormitories that were built with the, I don't know all my names of stone yet in Houston, but it, it's like the uh, the stone where it has all the cells and the left. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they pulled those dormitories down and I, I intended for the group of us to go and pull clay from the um, but when I was over there, like, doing recon ahead of time, uh, this guy came by from the neighborhood. He, we just started chatting. Um, I told him what I was and he said, oh, I think there's a lot of asbestos in that hair down. Oh, um, wow. You want to be careful what you take from He He was, like had already, I think, complained to the university just about how the construction site was being handled because of the asbestos. But anyway, so we ended up taking play from across the street where um, the university had just up the sidewalk. Um, but it that really- Less likely to be contaminated, probably. Yeah. And yeah. I still have students wear gloves when we worked with it, but- it it made me think of it made me think of wild clay in an urban setting and to all of the toxins that were kind of living around um, and the runoff from various like fertilizers and, and right like that. I, I I think that I hadn't thought about like the clay in the urban setting, but while I while I was processing some of the clay I harvested from Lake Houston, I was thinking yeah. about the philosophical ideas of being that I'm now removing impurities from the clay and bigger pieces and things, is it still considered wild clay, right? Because yeah. in a sense, I'm, you know, altering this natural clay into something that was not natural to make it more workable, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm not too picky about that, but...
Right. <laughs> well, one of the other places that I source play, because I'm interested in the idea of there being these, like, passive um, ways to act wild clay. So in a construction site, coming to the surface because all of the digging that the work that the workers are doing requires a foundation in the ground. Um, but I've also gathered a clay from a site in, in southern China, um, in the desert where there's geothermal activity in Andreas Fault. And mm -hmm. So there's like little volcanoes that are belching up um, mud. And I suspected that the, the that was probably clay. And so I went and gathered some. Um, and oh, um, Jeff, your audio, okay, there might be like a bit of a problem with your. Someone can not. Here. Yeah, I'm actually seeing one that says your audio is not very good. <laughs> okay. Right. Little chops. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that, though. It's probably our internet connectivity. Yeah. Um, so sorry about that. Oh, there's feedback. Um, let me see one second if I can... I'm, I'm, I'm only, I'm only seeing two. Well, while, while you're doing that, Anna, I'm going to address a question that was asked earlier, and I'm only, I'm only seeing two comments at a time. So if other people have asked questions and I've missed them, please, please re-ask and we'll address them. But the question I did see was Michelle's and asked if we considered our, our non-fired pieces performance art and for me for me personally i i do not like if anything it's like more socially engaged because i'm in this remote or away from a art kind of community setting and so i end up engaging people who start asking me questions about what i'm doing and i think it's a nice opportunity to engage the general public and talk about art but I don't, when I, when I document the work, usually my process is not a part of what I end up exhibiting. So I wouldn't necessarily consider it performance art, hmm. I guess. I hope that answers her question. I don't know how Anna feels as far as her process. And Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm super process oriented, um, but I, uh, I actually have never, I've never made work that is unfired. I, I always fire my ceramic work. Um, so it's kind of interesting that I've never <laughs> made anything that's not, that's not fired. Um, but I think Ooh. I'm, oh good, I'm glad the audio is improved. Um, I, yeah, for, um, I think I'm really interested in like kind of the different phases of of clay and of ceramic and how it can be so plastic um and and infinitely reclaimable so before it's fired you can always bring it back um mm -hmm. and then once it's fired it's um it's one of the most archival uh materials there is that can last for thousands of years um, under adverse conditions, <laughs> weather conditions, even. Um, yeah, the unpredictability. Uh, well, before before it's fired, yeah. But I, I'm talking about. I mean, I'm really interested in how um, once you fire clay, it it is so stable. It's one of the most stable materials that we have, right? Yeah. Yeah. De definitely, yeah. there's that dichotomy of like this super fragile malleable material and then the once it's fired very permanent strong material that's interesting to me as well yeah 
or well and you work with um the kind of entropy uh or yeah you work with entropy in the breakage of fired ceramics too so i mean i notice you kind of using like pieces um uh, parts of previously exhibited pieces you'll pull into another installation but sometimes in a different form where it's like broken or um fragmented mm -hmm. yeah am I, is my seeing this correctly yeah exactly i i think like the i could look at those things physically my my artwork like the on fired pieces and the fired pieces and look at them physically and formally, and they might appear to be two very different things, but I think that that idea of repetition and things breaking down and then re rebirth. So I've, I've taken unfired forms, works in situ, and let them weather for a time and then taken remnants from those and actually fired them. And so like repurposing a part of this previous thing. And I, I think the interest in that to me is, so like on one hand, I'm making these fired ceramic components that imply the sense of age and weathering. And then on, on the other hand, these installations or objects or sculptures that actually have a true history, right? And so sort of reusing these things. I'm trying to read. There was another. Oh, so someone asked if if we we're thinking about Annie Goldsworthy, and clear, clearly that's the first person that people think of when they start talking about like temporary pieces and working with natural elements. And I I was actually influenced more by Mono Ha, which is the Japanese version of Earthworks, essentially in the '60s, and I. I, I feel like, so my, my issue with Annie Goldsworthy, and I shouldn't even say issue because I, I love his work, but I feel like there's more of, there's more control and the hand of man is more evident than in some of the like Mona Ha, which really stays more true to the materials themselves and having the material relate to the landscape it's exhibited in, if that makes sense. And yeah, it seems... answers your question. I think that was I, Eileen that asked that. Yeah, I've been thinking about Andy Goldsworthy lately um, because, you know, there's a lot of conversations right now around um, during the quarantine and stay at home measures. There's a lot of conversations about who's doing the majority of the kind of unpaid unseen labor at home of, right. of child care and um and homeschooling and things like that and um anyway in in i don't know if it was in reference to one of those conversations but somebody was saying that andy goldsworthy's practice of going for these epic walks and kind of being out in the landscape for long periods of time was in part a response to his home life and wanting to <laughs> escape to like some children, like the, right. the children at home and the chaos of children at home. Um, anyway, yeah, it seems like Goldsworthy's work is, is about, um, yeah, kind of uh, making something ordered out of the natural world. Right, yeah. which, which would which would lend itself to having his hand more evident, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I actually thought when so when I was approached about doing the wild play challenge, I was like, that is such an appropriate time to do that because that's something you can actually do is go out in remote areas and try to find clay and still be socially distant, right? <laughs> And yeah. cl clearly there's so many health benefits to being in nature and not just staying in your home the whole time during the quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, I was really, I was 
loving living vicariously through you in your kayak <laughs> gathering clay that mm -hmm. was, it was great to see that oh, um well, we had a, we had a few questions from Clay Houston kind of before we started about um, like what recommendations we have for someone who's new to wild clay, tips on finding it in Houston or or in Texas in general. Um, uh, so I don't know if we want to yeah. uh, speak to any of that. Well, and I think I, we already addressed some of that, like, as far, as far as finding it, I think the easiest way is the construction site, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, and I, I think keeping track of where you have picked things up, because I'll, I'll do it walking the dog or, um, or I might be driving somewhere and I'll just pull over really quickly and pull something out, but then it's, it's you know, and you have to kind of geek out a little bit and, and log where you found the clay in case, you know, it's exactly what you want and then you know where to go back and find more. Right. Yes. Yeah, so similar to doing any glaze or clay test, right? Just keeping track so you can repeat it if it's successful. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think too for finding it, and I address this in my little video that was on the social media takeover, is that clay is essentially rock that's been weathered and decomposed and broken down into finer particles and water speeds that process up. So usually if there's a river or a creek or some kind of body of water, there's a good chance that you could also find clay if you dig enough, you know. And, and when I say dig, I don't necessarily mean grab a shovel and dig a lot of holes. I mean, if you, if you look hard enough, you'll find it. And sometimes, mm -hmm. like, right on the surface. Yeah. Yeah, it's really... Um, I, I actually w had never um, used wild clay. I'd been interested in it for a while, but I had never uh, used it until I moved to Houston, which is almost three years ago now. Um, and then I think I understood that the, that the soil had a high clay content and mm -hmm. learned from various ceramics people that, yeah, it's pretty easy to source. Um, and that spurred me to then think about other places I could source it um, in my travels. And what I've done too is twice now I've, I talked about the installation at UT Tyler. And at one point I had a installation in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And both times I got on Google earth and just kind of scrolled over the landscape. And particularly when it's, it has that high iron content, you'll see like an orange spot where there's clay that you could actually find on google earth and then i just drove out and would get a pickup truck load and bring it to my exhibition site yeah yeah wow um michelle's asked michelle matthews is asking have you thought about using the university of houston science department to analyze the properties yeah i just um I finally made contact with someone in the geology department at, at U of H um, who he works on salt. Um, so his, his work is really interesting. I was happy to meet him. And then uh, just as the pandemic was hitting, he introduced me to someone in the geology department who, who can do that kind of analysis. Um, so I'm eager to do that um, and find out, yeah, like what's in the um, the clay that my class pulled from the university construction site. And then, yes, to start maybe being able to compare that to other clay sourced in other parts of Houston or in Harris County as well. 
Um, I don't, I still don't really understand how detailed they can get. Um, like if it would be mostly identifying the minerals and metals that are in there, or if they would be able to say, yeah, there's asbestos in here, or there's fertilizer runoff or whatever. Yeah, I, I think, I would think they'd be able to identify a lot of that stuff. Because I, yeah. so Elizabeth Webb, who a lot mm -hmm. of you probably know, she was a core fellow at the Glassell School. She did this brick project. And after Hurricane Harvey had come through, she had the soil analyzed to make sure there were not contaminants and things that were brought in from, you know, the floodwaters. And so I, I, yeah. I, I could check with her and find out who she talked to to get, you know, that research done but i i was thinking and, since and, michelle asked that it sounds like a good graduate research project <laughs> <laughs> yes it does <laughs> um do you know what elizabeth found like did you get to see it, those results at all i i did and it was i didn't look at them super closely because it was a book full of very technical information but in in a nutshell, there was no like real toxic, harmful chemicals. So we go went ahead and proceeded using the material and making the bricks. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. So to return to what I was saying before, but didn't quite finish the um, the clay that came up through these mud pots in in Southern California. Um, that it's interesting comparing that or the potential of that to the clay that I've sourced in Houston because well one it's a more remote place out in the desert um but also the clay is coming from much further down I don't know how I mean it could be as far down as 30 feet or something mm -hmm. so that clay it's quite different um just to work with or to start working with because it's uh, it, it barely has to be processed because there's not a lot of like debris from the soil layer or whatever in it right. um it's pretty it's pretty good to go um but like that that part of the country um is right where the Colorado River w was kind of um, manipulated to send water to the desert there. Um, and so there, there is, um, there's water coming from really, really far away there. Um, it's, a, it's a place where a lot of things kind of converge. So th that's interesting too, to me, the idea that the wild clay would be registering how um, how our geology is m much more dynamic than we might think it is, you know, because of waterways sending um, sending well d debris or soil from different yeah. places. Yeah, yeah, moving moving material around. To, it's it's not, I guess, natural location. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of interesting thinking about the history of ceramics and ceramic artifacts because, um, you know, you can really kind of tell history by what, by what um, artifacts you find in what region and you can kind of trace the movement of people um, through like the Southwest, for example. So. Yeah. Well, it, it makes me question like when they're doing these chemical analysis on pots to determine where they are from, like mm -hmm. is the material, now that you bring that up, I'm wondering is the material actually from there or does it come from elsewhere, right? Yeah. I think, I think there's, I think that's something, some like um, 
archaeologists are looking at, right? Mm -hmm. Like being able to tell where people traveled based on what clay body ended up where. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, were there other, what were the other questions that Clay Houston had there for us? Um, I guess what the challenges and limitations of working with wild clay are. Right. We've been focusing on the, yeah. the possible toxicity as one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe that's a limitation. Maybe that's a potential. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Depends on perspective, right? And it's interesting because <laughs> yeah. neither of us really process the clay per se to use it like. So I, I could see like, I know there's very high sand content in a lot of the clay I've found. So if you can ima imagine a clay body that's got like 50% grog or something and you're trying to roll a coil and it's crumbling, like that's like oh, what a lot of the clays like that I've discovered. And so if I was going to try to work with it on the wheel, for example, clearly there would be more of a processing of the clay and probably putting it through more sieves. And so I, for me, I guess, I don't know if I consider that a challenge. It just makes it more time consuming to make the clay workable, depending upon what you're doing with it. Yeah. Figuring out what, what you can actually do with it. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think it's like, it's really different to work with and, um, you just have to kind of see like how far you can push it. Uh, and then I guess part of that is testing it in the kiln, firing it to different um, temperatures to see what it does, how it behaves at, right. at those different temperatures, right? Yeah, there's, so I'm not sure how many people know Dennis LaValle. Dennis teaches at Elvin College like I guess that's an hour, hour and a half south of Houston. And he's actually done a fair amount of research testing the different, the three or so different clays that are local to the Houston area or the Gulf mm. Coast area and firing them to different temperatures. And he actually, a number of years back, I had some communication with him and he shared images of fist fired pieces and different clays and then the same clays fired at cone five and six and it's pretty interesting and we talked we talked about my going out there to visit him and it just never has happened right um yeah i think i was kind of thinking about it in preparation to talk today and i was thinking about how um uh working with wild clay even just a little bit has sensitized me has had the effect of sensitizing me to um the other clays that i'm working with so the the clays that i'm just buying um right. and i've been working a lot with cassius basaltic um clay this really black um, this clay body that fires to a beautiful, deep, almost metallic black. Um, because I, for a, an ongoing series of morning wear um, that I've been making, and that the black, the beautiful color of that comes from it having a high content of manganese. Right. And so yeah. then I think because I'm more, much more sensitized to kind of um where clay is coming from and <clears throat> uh how it comes out of the ground and everything i then i looked into the mining of manganese and it's super problematic and and um not sustainable yeah. <laughs> to say the least it's not sustainable in how it kind of accesses human labor how it uses human labor and everything so that's been kind of interesting and i feel like maybe that would have happened anyway because I'm the longer I'm making work the more I'm kind of thinking about it in terms of sustainability um, yeah. and, and wanting my practice to be uh, 
more uh, have as little an environmental impact as possible. Um, but I think it, it also is from kind of tuning into to clay as something that um, is being extracted out of the ground. Right. I mean, so certainly the fact that it is just the earth is like one of the things that brought me to clay to begin with, right? And it's long history that you've already addressed. But th thinking about the mines, like some of those mines for more popular materials, like Gertzley Borate, for example, like some of those holes they're digging to mine those materials, like you could build cities in them. Like they're right. just enormous. So yeah, thinking about the impact. Uh, you, even, even though like this commercial clay is coming out of the ground, it's like the impact on the earth and environment and the process and the mining of it. And then it ships, you know, they dig it out and then it ships to some processing plant where it probably goes through a bunch of equipment that's creating pollutants and but yeah I, yeah it's pretty where, yeah it's a little bit depressing to think about but it's like it's human nature like everything we do is like bad for the environment essentially <laughs> well and i yeah i mean i think i've also been thinking about extractive processes and, and industries from being in Texas now because that's such a in the Permian Basin it's you know there's so much fracking um, in the state so I think that's also maybe influenced how I'm thinking about uh, the harvesting of clay as well yeah what well, I know yeah. when I started building the unfired pieces like part of what was driving that was the simple fact that there's so many things already like just so many objects you know and it's a lot a lot of it's like that idea of mass production which is why i just love handmade ceramics also you know like using a handmade coffee cup instead of a cup from a manufacturing plant or something but yeah i, I do struggle with like the idea of like producing all of these things. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone just asked about using um, the Cassius manganese heavy clay and about taking safety precautions. And yeah, I wear gloves and I'm extra careful with the, with um, managing the dust from it. Um, and that's something too that it it's like much less pleasurable to work with than other clays where I don't have to wear gloves. Um, so I think it's also kind of registering that. And if if I have to wear gloves to work with it, then how is it being harvested? And and at at what other points in the chain is it dangerous to people? Um, but it's a hard one that that clay body is so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I have the fortune of having a student who is also a chemical engineer. And mm. so, we, so we have these conversations often about like the toxicity of materials and, you know, his and what he always says and it's what you'd kind of guess anyhow is most of these things are really most toxic in their like powdered dry stage yeah. right yeah it's, it's the inhalation of the dust that's the most dangerous part of that i would guess yeah 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 i mean i sort of laugh about it sometimes um i remember when i used to do i used to do flower design um to make money and i worked for these event companies that were doing these huge, huge events. So I would make the same um, arrangement over and over again, like 20 times or 30 times. And, um, but I remember when people would find out <laughs> that I was doing that for work, they would get so excited and romantic about it and think that it was like 
um, me in a field, like picking sure. beautiful flowers and just like um, effortlessly putting them together. And I was like, no, no, I work like 16 hour days standing on concrete, sometimes in like a parking garage outside an event space or something. But I think some of that comes into play with ceramics too, where people feel really, people who don't do it, they feel really romantic about it. And we know sure. that it is, it is a wonderful thing to have your hands in this like living material and to to enjoy that the just like gorgeous plasticity of it but then there's also these other parts to it where you have to clean up for an hour afterwards every time and um all of yeah. the health and safety stuff yeah, I, I don't know if you guys are all seeing this too, but I now have a one minute and 35 second tick down timer. Okay, well, we should wrap up then. Um, okay. But we want to encourage people to do the hashtag TX wild clay challenge, right? Is that yeah, the hashtag? I'd, I'd love to see all kinds of wild clay artworks like showing up on folks Instagram accounts now. Yeah, well, and for those of you who aren't in Texas, um, please do it in California. You can go out to the desert, get some clay. Um, what East Coast, clay everywhere on the East Coast. So yeah. um, you can tag it with, with the Texas hashtag, but then also specify where, you're, where your wild clay is coming from. Yeah. yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm inspired to do some more myself again. <laughs> Me too. Good. Me too. Now, it was really nice chatting with you, Anna, and thanks for yeah. thank you all for your comments and questions. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to see you, Jeff. I hope to see you in, in person at some point soon. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Yes, I look forward to it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. You all take care. Bye. Bye. I'm going to figure out how to end this. <laughs> and save it uh, and